As a managing director of Echo Vietnam, what does sustainability mean to you? I think sometimes leather is a little bit misunderstood. So I would say for most companies, I don't think they can really afford not to be green. Um, uh, it's, it's the way the business is going. What do you think are some barriers that stop them from practicing sustainable way of operation? One that you might always hear is financial. And then the last one, and this is the biggest one in my view, is mindset. Do they really want it? Hello and welcome to V-Success Business Podcast. This is Kuo Khan, your host, and you're listening to Greenovate series. This is a collaboration between V-Success and Nordcham, Nordic Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam. In this series, we're going to talk to corporate leaders, industry pioneers, experts, activists about the topics of green economy, innovations, and sustainability. My guest today, he has been in Vietnam for 16 years, working in sustainability-related manufacturing. He is the managing director of Echo Vietnam. Echo is the biggest Danish shoemaker serving markets in 99 countries around the world. And today, we hope to learn more about sustainable supply chain and how manufacturing businesses are dealing with sustainability challenges. So, such an honor to welcome Mr. Alex Fater, Managing Director of Echo Vietnam. Thank you so much. How are you? Thank you very much for the invitation. It's very nice to be here with you. Nice to meet you as well. What brought you to Vietnam 16 years ago? Well, uh, I think, as you said in your introduction, I've always been involved in manufacturing, and um, uh, we saw a lot of uh, European manufacturers moving to uh, to Asia. And so, 16 years ago, I joined a sustainable garment manufacturer in the north of Vietnam. And uh, well, I pretty much fell in love with your country, so I'm <laughs> still here. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah, sort of now here already. Yeah. So, as a managing director of Echo Vietnam. What does sustainability mean to you? It's such a big word, isn't yeah. it? And uh, I think if we look at the last 10, 15 years, it's been used in so many different ways. Mm. Um, I think sustainability is about doing things in the present that doesn't impact your future too much, right? Mm. So um, I, I like the ESG terms where you look at you know the environment, uh, the social side, the governance side of things. I think ENG, ESG sorry, encapsulates what sustainability is. Uh, and of course, you have the E, which, which is very much about the environment. And that's, uh, that's something we see every day uh, as companies are uh, slowly uh, you know, adapting the way they work to take into account the, the environment. Uh, the social side is very important. Uh, there's a lot more um, focus on, mm. how, uh, on how people treat their workforce. And of course, uh, the governance side of things, which uh, maybe we won't talk so much about here, but you need uh, you need things in place, whether it's a country, whether it's a, whether it's an organization, uh, to make sure that uh, things are treated in a fair and respectful manner. Hmm. So I know Echo Vietnam, you guys have built a factory here from scratch. So you have your own you know supply chain here, um, um, pretty uh, sustainable model here. But tell me more about. Uh, a sustainable manufacturing process. Uh, what does it mean by sustainable factory? Yeah, I mean, um, in the case of, of Echo Vietnam, um, we, uh, we developed a factory starting in 2016 uh, where we, uh, uh, from the outset, we thought, okay, what, how do we want our factory to be environmentally sound? Uh, we applied a lot of uh, lead principles, uh, which uh, are building construction principles. So it means that we use a lot of solar power. Uh, we use a lot of uh, rainwater harvesting. Uh, we have uh, electric uh, bike ports if you want to recharge your bike. Um, but it's not just that those are maybe the, the low-hanging fruit. Uh, if you want to build a lead factory, you also look a little bit at the impact on the environment. So. How far do your workers need to travel every day to get to work? Um, what kind of uh, windows and doors are you using to make sure that uh, you're not losing a lot of energy that way? 
Are you using grass uh, that uh, needs a lot of water or can you use a desert style grass that uh, actually has a much less water impact? So um, there's a lot of different ways of being sustainable. Um, in terms of the factory itself, we we're very lucky that when you build a new factory, you can add all this in. Mm. Uh, some older factories you see in Vietnam, it's a little bit different because they have to then retrofit and that can be very expensive. So um, yeah, luckily with Vietnam newly industrializing, there's a great opportunity for a lot of the new factories to have mm -hmm. a high standard from the outset. But what seemed to be the biggest challenge when you built a sustainability focused factory in Vietnam from the get-go? I think the building itself is 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 not too challenging. I think you need to your investors need to understand that it's probably going to be a little bit more expensive to start off with, uh, and that you can recoup those costs over time. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that the the bigger challenge in Vietnam is probably how to operate in a sustainable way, mm -hmm. uh, and um, we see already that. Um, uh, some of the regulations when it comes to, for example, rooftop solar uh, can be uh, a bit stop start. Mm. Uh, and we see, especially in the waste sector, uh, that there's a lot of investment that's needed in order to have a, a stronger focus on this going forwards. Um, and this is where I think the Vietnamese government needs to start making some uh, bigger strides. Hmm. Uh, I, I know with interest that the World Bank uh, is also looking uh, at Bing Yung at the moment uh, with a view to seeing how it can support uh, industry there with, with facilitating waste uh, incineration or, or different levels of, of waste processing. Uh, unfortunately, walking around Vietnam, we see in many cases, waste is just left by the side of the street. Um, that is certainly not the case in in, in Echo Vietnam. But nevertheless, uh, I do think uh, I do think there are big improvements that can be made, and in the future, investors will demand it. So they need to be ready. Yeah. So mm. I would say building is fairly easy, operating sustainably. This this is something we need to work on. So what are some of the solutions from Echo Vietnam trying to solve the problem of sustainable operation? I think in Echo, we've always been pretty good in designing uh, products where we take waste into consideration. Um, in addition to that, we are vertically integrated. So we're, we're involved at, at the beginning at a tannery level if we're using leather. Uh, we own all our own factories, so we're able to uh, to make sure that we plan and, and, and load our factories in the right way. Mm -hmm. And then we also own our supply, uh, supply chain and uh, the retail side of the business. So we're actually fully integrated and uh, it means we can, uh, we can service the market in the most efficient way possible. Mm. Tell me more about the dry tan technology. Uh, that's something that could be a you know, important factor for you guys in the journey of sustainability uh, development. Correct, correct. It's uh, it's very exciting. Um, out of university, I started uh, working in a tannery, and uh, tannery is a, mm -hmm. a very, very old uh, craft uh, that has probably been going for mm. three, four, five thousand years. Uh, but it's uh, it's one that consumes a lot of water. Uh, because you are taking animal hides and you are dyeing them and that takes quite a few processes. Um, and what's really exciting about what Echo has been developing is this dry tan which limits the water usage uh, and eventually um, just using one, one cycle of water basically so no new water will go into that process. Uh, and looking ahead, and you know, it's still under development, uh, there might also be the opportunity of tanning without water where mm -hmm. pressure is used. So this is something that makes me incredibly proud to work for ECHO because mm -hmm. uh, it's a company that invests in R&D that, that, that makes these efforts to try and limit the impact on the environment. So uh, dry tan is one, there are others as well. And um, yeah, it's, it feels good to work for a company that, that, that makes the effort mm -hmm. to find ways to, to, to solve some of the environmental issues of the day. Is that the popular pra practice that been applied to in the manufacturing business? I would say most people now, most brands uh, will be looking at this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there are many brands out there that uh, own the whole supply chain, though. Mm 
So your other brands out there, and let's name a few, be it Nike or Adidas or all these brands, they're, they're mostly working with uh, OEM suppliers, so original equipment manufacturers. Um, and these factories, of course, will then need to make the investments uh, in order to secure orders. Um, whereas in Echo, it's, it's kind of in our DNA that we do it right uh, at the beginning uh, by owning that supply chain. So um, I would say it's probably easier for us to do it. Uh, but I know that everybody in the industry is moving in this direction. Hmm. If owning a supply chain gives you that much advantage, why don't many other companies apply it? Well, there are advantages and there are disadvantages, um, and I think that um, uh, I think that a lot of companies may have been put off by uh, uh, having to uh, manage a large workforce uh, that was of often moving to Asia. Yeah. Um, maybe they they felt that working on you know research and development, marketing and retail was 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 closer to their aims. Uh, but I think Echo has a has a, a heritage that is very much uh, shoemaking based, mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't think uh, this really put Echo off. I think uh, the whole manufacturing is very much at the core uh, of what the brand does. So um, yeah, each each brand will have taken their own uh, journeys over the last you know decades, uh, but Echo has stayed true to manufacturing its own shoes. The shoemaking uh, industry, you guys sometimes have a lot of scrutiny because of the high usage of uh, animal leather, especially cow leather. Um, how do you address these challenges? How do you address this problem? Yeah. The shoemaking uh, industry, you guys sometimes have a lot of scrutiny because of the high usage of uh, animal leather, especially cow leather. Um, how do you address these challenges? How do you address this problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you see a lot of uh, media attention given to the use of fur, to the use of leather. Um, I mean, we, we have a slightly different view maybe to the more kind of um, uh, the more aggressive tones that are sometimes taken in the media. Um, le leather is a byproduct hmm. uh, of the dairy and the meat industry. So uh, once these animals, these cows mostly, uh, go for slaughter, the, the skin itself, the hide, mm. uh, is left over and it's a byproduct. Uh, I think the greatest respect you can give to the animal is to, to use it fully, right? And mm. uh, uh, that is what we do in tanning. We take these byproducts and we convert them into a fabric that is, you know, A, beautiful, mm. uh, it's durable, uh, it's breathable, Uh, and you know we make it into shoes and bags and automotive okay. interiors so um, yeah I, I think sometimes leather is a little bit misunderstood okay uh, I'd probably add as well that if we didn't tan all those skins what would we be doing with them um, and you'd probably have uh, a lot of rotting decomposing skins creating a lot of methane mm. so um, no i think uh, i think the tanning industry and the shoe industry when it uses leather is uh, is a force for good mm. um, of course it has to be processed in the right way in the right ethical way something recycle exactly somehow right using the right chemicals not using too much water so uh, really using best practice uh, and if that is followed then i see it as very sustainable um I mean, a lot of companies when they come to Vietnam and set up the factory, and especially they want to follow the rules of sustainability, and uh, they're wondering what kind of condition in Vietnam in order to have the right factory, the right setup, the right procedure of building a factory. Um, just wondering, wondering what kind of lesson that we can learn from Echo Vietnam. Well, I think... I think Vietnam has has improved a lot uh, in the last years. I mean, for a start, uh, Vietnam is now zoning its factories. In the past, they just used to be anywhere somebody thought, uh, whereas now you have industrial zones. I mean, that's already a, a big start. Um, and there's a lot of thought being put into uh, what I said earlier about constructing uh, in the right way. 
Um, but operationally, I think uh, I think Vietnam needs to uh, maintain the course to becoming carbon neutral. Uh, Prime Minister Chin, he made that commitment uh, uh, for Vietnam to be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, and uh, all the corporations will need to follow. So I think uh, giving good regulations to support uh, more rooftop solar, uh, giving good regulations to, to support the waste and the water industries uh, will help a lot. Um, I also think Vietnam needs to continue developing. It has traditionally been a market where people assemble. Mm -hmm. So things are coming from yeah. different countries and we put them together here. Uh -huh. um, as Vietnam develops its tier one, tier two, tier three supplier base, uh, there'll be less need to import from other countries. So that will have an impact on logistics and the CO2 created by that. Uh, and hopefully we can start to have these competence clusters in mm -hmm. Vietnam where you can put together a full product uh, within the country. So I think this will help as well. Um, I know that the uh, EU-Vietnam uh, free trade deal is also really pushing for uh, product uh, to have a, a strong rules of origin so that a lot of the product is coming from Vietnam. And I think that all these, all these different forces uh, will help uh, Vietnam in the future. Yeah. And um, so how does sustainability practice at Eco Vietnam affect your bottom line? for your business? Well, in short, um, sustainability is, is a bit of an investment uh, at first, uh, but uh, over the course of operations, uh, of course, you, you start to recoup that um, talking basic bottom line. Mm -hmm. However, you have certain ant intangibles, I would say. Um, there is, uh, of course, an expectation from consumers uh, that you are doing the right things. So that is, of course, helping uh, attract uh, more customers to the brand. I would say maybe uh, younger customers mm -hmm. to the brands who are more aware of uh, green issues. Um, so I would say for most companies, I don't think they can really afford not to be green. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the way the business is going. So what is the, the biggest challenge that you are facing right now in terms of trying to follow sustainability um, procedures and the way you're doing business here? So uh, for the ECHO group, I would say uh, it depends on, on different countries. I would say uh, Europe is, is, is quite advanced when it comes to uh, supporting sustainability and, and, and having a, a clean ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking for Vietnam, uh, I, I think, again, waste is a big issue. Uh, sometimes some of the inefficiencies uh, when it comes to logistics. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just looking around, you, you, you don't have a lot of the electric cars that we do in other countries. Um, and um, I think the regulations when it comes to green energy need to be uh, either moving forwards uh, or, or, or need to support, let's say, expansion of rooftop solar, uh, good feed-in tariffs. So uh, I think that there's quite a bit that we can do here in Vietnam uh, to, to make that more attractive. And I'd go as far as saying that Vietnam needs to do this if it wants to continue attracting FDI. Mm -hmm. um, more and more uh, new investors will be looking at countries that can help them uh, support mm -hmm. their green initiatives. And this is an area where right. uh, Vietnam needs to be on the ball here. Mm, sure. You mentioned uh, consumers earlier. I'm curious about Echo's consumer. What are they expecting from Echo in the future in terms of sustainable product? Well. Echo's consumer is uh, very, very broad. Uh, we're a brand for families, um, so uh, it covers uh, everything. Um, generally speaking, uh, I would say uh, the goal of being carbon neutral by 2030 is a goal that most Echo uh, consumers would, would greatly support. Uh, but of course, alongside that, uh, that sustainability initiative, uh, they expect you know, great quality, good comfort, uh, uh, and up-to-date designs. So um, uh, I would say, especially the, the younger markets going forwards, uh, they will expect green uh, as a standard. But how do you communicate to those customers? What is their knowledge right now about this green and sustainability topics? 
It's a good question. I mean, um, there's uh, there's quite a bit of greenwashing out there in the market where um, people can make bold claims or and, and, and then they can be um, uh, often disproven in the media. Uh, I would say that we're quite a cautious company. Uh, we have a cautious mindset. Um, we probably don't tell our story uh, as broadly and widely as we could. Our practices and our actions is what speaks louder, right? Um, so I think some of the developments we do with our tanneries, uh, some of the other developments we have uh, in terms of uh, recycling our waste usage, uh, these are things that will bear fruit. Uh, and I think anybody who knows the Echo brand uh, knows that we are working on these uh, quietly, but um, with actions rather than words. Yeah. yeah. And besides consumers, how do you engage other stakeholders like suppliers, your employees about this kind of practice? I mean, in terms of suppliers, obviously, we have a, a fairly rigorous uh, audit. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, we don't just look at, um, let's say, the health and safety or the, the, the social uh, side of their businesses. We also like to make sure that environmentally they are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of our employees, I mean, they are, they are on this journey. We have a very, very strong uh, culture in ECHO. Um, we uh, often communicate our uh, environmental values. Of course, it, it, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, you know, uh, people's day-to-day -day lives, they have a lot going on. Uh, so it's, it's really a case of constantly reminding about doing information sessions, raising awareness. Um, but we can't do it alone. Uh, it also has to come from uh, from society, right? Yeah, sure. In a country like uh, like Vietnam, uh, a lot of that is also government driven. Mm -hmm. um, so I, we always like to find where we can uh, do partnerships with people because raising awareness uh, this will help a lot for the younger generations. Yeah. I think there's a few barriers. Um, one that you might always hear is financial. You know, I, I would push back a little bit there because I think there's a lot of mechanisms out there uh, where people are prepared to, to invest on your behalf uh, and do long payback periods. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, three letter uh, ESG at the beginning of the conversation. And we talk a lot about the environment uh, sector, but how about the social and the governance? What are some of the key issues that you are facing right now? Uh, I would say generally we, we are not facing uh, social or governance issues. Um, I think uh, uh, socially, you know, do you have an attractive workplace? Are people getting paid uh, a fair amount? Can they support their families? Uh, are we, uh, you know, respecting the, the hours worked uh, per week? So there's a lot of things that we, as a European company, do, do right. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I, if I do look uh, in Vietnam in general, uh, there are some companies that uh, maybe do not follow the rules quite as well. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, uh, with the strong uh, socialist foundations of Vietnam, uh, I'm not too worried. Uh, it's generally a country that uh, that does respect workers' rights, mm -hmm. and if we compare to maybe some of the the neighboring countries or, or, or regional countries, mm -hmm. uh, I think Vietnam has a very very good start. It has mm -hmm. strong uh, community values, strong family values uh, that we can build upon. How about the, the governance? I mean, what is Echo's philosophy on this issue? I mean, generally speaking, uh, we get uh, the right amount of leeway from headquarters to operate uh, in the country as we see fit. Uh, I think Vietnam being, a, you know, over the last few decades, a very independent country mm -hmm. uh, has a very strong governance, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we work together with the authorities to make sure that uh, that things are in accordance with the law, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, making suggestions where possible, where things can be improved. So I think governance is, is, is something that Vietnam has always held very dear. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of structures in place in Vietnam. Uh, and, and generally the authorities are always keen to hear new ideas. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's also a little bit why the governance structure is always evolving in Vietnam mm -hmm. is because there are always uh, tweaks and adjustments uh, that make the environment better. Yeah, we are in 2023 and what is this landscape of the shoemaking industry for now? What is the general sand right now? 
I think uh, I think Vietnam is 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 very well positioned to be a shoemaker for many many decades to come. Mm-hmm. Um, its position is, uh, uh, you know, in the middle of, of Asia Pacific, uh, India, China, uh, ASEAN. Everybody is 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 close to Vietnam. I think there are five billion people within a five-hour flight mm. of Ho Chi Minh City. I mean, That's just think about that. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think it's not just footwear. I think a lot of products will be made in Vietnam uh, going forwards. I think. One thing that will happen is that Vietnam will start to add more value. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, wages are going up, um, competencies are going up, efficiencies are going up. So I think some of the, maybe the cheaper product, maybe some of the more unsustainable, mm-hmm. un- unsustainably cheaper products uh, will, will, will go elsewhere. But I think anything with, uh, with a good quality standard uh, will remain in Vietnam because it, it's no longer a question of price it's more a question of value yeah and sustainability and green is some of the factor that must have in this industry absolutely uh, if vietnam wants to keep uh, attracting uh, foreign investment it needs to be able to offer a sustainable and green platform mm-hmm. uh, and we can see some other recent uh, Uh, Danish uh, investments here in Vietnam, they were very much based on, on on having those those green platforms, just like it was with Echo. Yeah. I mean, it's no surprise to me when talking to Nordic members, um, businesses like Danish or Swedish, because you guys apply this concept very easily from the get-go. But from, like, let's say, a manufacturing uh, owner, What do you think are some barriers that stop them from practicing sustainable way of operation? I think there's a few barriers. Um, one that you might always hear is financial. You know, I, I would push back a little bit there because I think there's a lot of mechanisms out there uh, where people are prepared to, to invest on your behalf uh, and do long payback periods. Mm-hmm. Um, I think sometimes there's there's legacy. So sometimes there may be a, a production site mm-hmm. that is not fit for purpose. Um, and then the last one, and this is the biggest one in my view, is mindset. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do they really want it? Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, the business dynamic in Vietnam is so fast uh, sure. that industries are constantly changing. Mm. Uh, and a business owner really needs to know uh, what the next 10 or 15 years look like. And I'd say that in in Western countries, which have had more time to develop, you can predict that. Mm. But here in Vietnam, uh, I think uh, I, I, it, it is harder to predict because things are always changing so fast. Yeah. You mentioned a lot about waste management. I'm just curious from your experience living here for 16 years and see how Vietnam is changing. What is your observation on the waste management here? What waste management? Um, yeah. <laughs> There is none. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh. it's, it's very unfortunate. Um, I, uh, you know, referring back to upcycling, right? Mm. I, I recall moving to Vietnam a, a long time ago and 16 years, as you say, and um, people would uh, people would use banana leaves uh, to keep uh, to keep food fresh. Um, they would use, uh, you know, c- Coke cans as part of their exhausts. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you, you, you had this mindset of, of using everything and not wasting anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas now. When I look around on the streets, I see a lot of single-use plastics mm. being thrown around. I see waste not really being processed or sorted in the right way. Um, so I think there needs to be a stronger regulation uh, on on how we, we handle waste. And then I have no doubt Vietnam will fall into line and become uh, back to where it was. I mean, uh, the mindset there for not wasting is is, is already there in the Vietnamese. Mm-hmm. We just need to to guide a bit mm-hmm. better. 
Um, but all the all the the waste we see in Vietnam, I'm I'm confident can be removed, and then in five ten years, yeah, we have a beautiful country again. Mm. Uh, but it really does need leadership uh, from the top. Sure. So for Echo Vietnam, what seem to be the areas that you guys still need to focus on to improve more in order to be more sustainable? Oh, definitely the waste side of things. The so, waste. So um, at the moment, uh, if you're a processing zone, uh, there's quite a few. Uh, uh, customs obligations that people need to go through. And this is all fair. It's all to to make sure that taxes are paid on import and exports. Uh, but nevertheless, there are certain developments, I think, that can be had with, with the waste. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can be turned into different materials. Uh, they could be uh, given to uh, training schools. Uh, there are a lot of different things we could do with that waste that we are doing in other countries. But we can't do in Vietnam yet due to regulations. So uh, I really hope that the the regulations follow a, a, a sustainable and clean business mindset. Well, regulations, I guess. Yeah. What was the most critical or strategic decision that you have made that make an impact on Echo's sustainability journey here in Vietnam? Well, I, I suppose I couldn't really... Uh, say that it's about Vietnam, but I, I think Echo in general has a huge strategic advantage by being vertically integrated. Mm. We control everything. So from the beginning when the hides are made to the production to the retail. Uh, and I think that this this is an advantage very, very few other brands have, mm-hmm. very, very few other sectors have. Uh, and I think that that really uh, puts us ahead. It means we have a lot of knowledge about a lot of different things uh, and we can make the right long-term decisions. We are a family-owned company um, okay. and uh, yeah. the family is, is, is very engaged in, in how we do business the right way and, and, and the, the, you know, for the long term. So um, that helps a lot, vertical integration and family ownership. Vertical integration. Why is it so hard to do that? Well, there's quite a few different competencies that you need to have. And sometimes those competencies can clash with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need a very uh, enlightened management team that can that can always balance uh, the different uh, the different needs of the business. Um, and um, I think over time, as, as people became more specialized, more focused in their areas, maybe they, they thought about removing uh, certain non-core items to their business. Uh, but in Echo, we, we want to understand everything, every detail. Mm-hmm. So that's why we, we maintain a very, very broad uh, sector of operations. Great. When talking about long term, we got to talk about sustainability. Mm-hmm. And uh, some people say consumer nowadays have the power to demand from, from businesses because they want to use, they want to have sustainable product. Uh, what is your thought on the power of the consumer like that? Uh, do they can they really make a big change in the business way, uh, so businesses can really adapt and, and changing their way of doing business because of the customer demand? Yes, yeah. Consumers are, are, are very, very, very vocal nowadays. You have uh, social media and lots of opinions, yeah. and uh, I think it's really, really interesting how much product choice there is out there as well. So. Um, Yeah, Uh, corporations are increasingly having to follow uh, consumer demands. Uh, But it's also interesting to see how governments are also forming regulations uh, following what their populace are needing. You see Mm. uh, green parties being voted in more frequently in in European countries. uh, And that, of course, has an effect on what kind of uh, green regulations are taking place. Mm. So um, I wouldn't say it's just consumers. I think generally it's humanity that is moving in a, in a greener direction. Glad to hear. So beside regulation, uh, what needs to be changed from the government side, from the policymakers, in order to have a better environment for, for businesses like Echo Vietnam to thrive and to be more sustainable way? I think there needs to maybe be um, a bit more trust in companies, uh, removal of bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe there also needs to be uh, removal of certain subsidies. Uh, so uh, there are certain areas of uh, Vietnam industry that are still controlled uh, very much from a centralized perspective. Um, and and that has certain advantages for sure. 
but at the same time, it, it doesn't necessarily follow the market need. Mm -hmm. So I think there's certain liberalizations that are required um, for Vietnam to really uh, become uh, market driven, so to speak, and be able to react quickly uh, to global trends. It's a big step to move from a, um, a producer uh, to really adding value in the country. And for that, you need the freedom. So um, I think Vietnam needs to continue its reforms uh, towards liberalization uh, of the economy. Oh, great. So after 16 years, what do you love about this country? Well, there are many things. I love uh, the food, the scenery, um, <laughs> I guess so. the, uh, uh, the nature, uh, but of course it's the people that really You've been, you've been around pretty much over the country? Uh, 62 out of 63 provinces. <laughs> yeah, that's so, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm a, a big fan of Vietnam um, and of course my, my wife and children are Vietnamese. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I consider myself Vietnamese. <laughs> Great, welcome to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so nowadays people talk a lot about green sustainable development sustainability it becomes such a buzzword in the media nowadays and a lot of businesses go for this and like you said a lot of green watch as well from someone who have been working in this industry for so long what is your thought about this movement this thing in vietnam it's a, in a developing country like vietnam when we talk about sustainable development we talk about sustainability how how is this going forward? I mean, I think it's super exciting when you're in a developing country because you can leapfrog. You can see all the mistakes that were made in Europe, US, maybe some other countries, and you can actually leapfrog all those mistakes. Um, Vietnam, uh, up until you know the mid '80s, was a fairly uh, agrarian society. There mm. was not a lot of heavy industry. Maybe maybe a bit in the north, but yeah. but. Uh, by and large, it was very much a, a focused on agriculture. And um, I think industry is still relatively new. I mean, 15, 20, 25 yeah. years old. And so a lot of the best practices that have been honed and developed over 200 years of industrialization in, in Europe and the US can actually be leapfrogged and brought into Vietnam. So I think developing countries have an advantage that they can see the mistakes made by developed economies in the past. Oh, well, thank you for sharing. Uh, good luck with the journey you had. Thank you so much. Uh, that's the story of Mr. Alex Fatter, Managing Director of Echo Vietnam. Echo is the biggest Dennis shoemaker right now, serving more than uh, 90 countries around the world. Uh, the important messages that we have to keep in mind today is that vertical integration uh, and owning a supply chain will play a big part in Echo's sustainability journey. And to have a sustainable factory, the operation process is more important than the building process. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please subscribe to VSuccess channel uh, for more upcoming episodes or follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. You just have to search the keyword with success business or Greenovate to find our step episode online and can, you can listen to the conversation anytime you want. So thank you and see you next time. Mm -hmm.